good to go. Thank you guys for sticking around. This is going to be a roadmap update, uh, continuing the long tradition of concluding Zeek Week with a talk about the roadmap. Um, I wanted to take a quick minute, since I think this is a good reminder to uh, uh, several folks in the audience, uh, of what is our release cadence, not just what is in the releases, but how we do them. Because there's actually a fair amount of information uh, in a Zeek version number, and, and that is you know a good thing to know about. Um, so for context, um, we aim to have three feature releases per year. And this looks roughly as follows. So it starts with a .o release. Uh, right now, the latest would be uh, 5.0, right? Uh, that is our uh, long-term support release. So we uh, will continue to um, apply backports and so forth, uh, security fixes and so forth to that release. Um, it usually comes out uh, early in the, well, uh, late in the year, <laughs> sorry, uh, depending on timing a little bit. Um, and once that has been released, as time goes by, there might be bug fix releases. So we might do a .0.1. Um, and when about a third of the year has gone by, there is the next feature release. Okay, so that would be .1. Uh, 5.1 is about to come out. And again, when there is a reason to create a bug fix release, that would come out um, as part of that release. Um, I should mention uh, that this is also the release where we usually deprecate Sorry, where we remove deprecation, so we dep deprecate things across, you know, uh, the preceding releases, and this is usually the one where we pull material that we no longer want to have in the distribution. Uh, there's a file in there that is very useful for tracking uh, what changes happen in, in release to release, so you might want to take a look at that, particularly when you move to the .1 release, because it might be critical for, for your setting. And what I meant to say here is basically that when a new bug fix release comes out, we basically take those same bug fixes and also apply them to the LTS release branch. So there will also be a .0.2 in this case, you know, release that applies them over there. And then again, about a third of a year goes by, and then there's a .2 release. Um, the, latest, the latest one that would be available uh, currently would be 4.2, but that's you know from the last cycle dated. Um, and the same applies here. If you know a bug fix release rolls around, we will continue that in that uh, line of releases and also put it back into the LTS line of releases. And then most likely the year is up and the cycle continues with the next LTS release. And to show you a little bit about what that looks like right now, so I just mentioned that we're close to the 5.1 release, so we are here. Um, 5.0 came out in the summer um, and I thought I'd show you a little bit about how we've been doing about timing. Um, so I put in here uh, basically the days on which we uh, tagged the releases in Git. And you don't need to look at the dates too much, but I added the deltas. And if you start over here, so looking at 4.0, right, it took us about five months to make it to 4.1. It took us about five months to make it to 4.2. And then it took us really long, seven months to make it to 5.0. And that was for a couple of specific reasons that we can go into detail about. Um, but then basically to make up for it a little bit, we expedited 5.1, which is just around the corner. It's in the hands of the testing teams right now. Um, and we intentionally sped that up so that we're sort of back in rhythm a little bit. But as you can see, there's basically a bit of a risk that we're not quite able to stick to our three releases a year, but we'll, we'll try to you know do better. Um, but I thought I'd show you guys that because I think it's sometimes not quite clear like where we are in this and, and how we go about making releases. <laughs> You can see more information about all of this in our wiki. There is a release cadence page alongside other documentation about our processes and so forth if you're ever curious about this kind of stuff. All right, roadmap. Still not quite there. I'm going to add a couple more slides. Uh, philosophy. So I thought I'd clarify like how we feel about our releases. So the first thing to say is that we think it's OK when plans change. So we aim for a certain set of features. Sometimes circumstances come up where it's clear that another feature is more important, that something has to wait a little bit longer and needs to get dropped, and so forth. And we think that is OK. We also think it's OK to say that a great release beats a punctual one. So we don't put out a date there where we say, like, on that date, you're going to have a release. Uh, I have to add a little asterisk to that because our release manager will get me in trouble if I take that too far. <laughs> so <laughs> 
for uh, <laughs> uh, for 5.0 that arguably happened, and we took a little bit too long for, like I said, for various reasons. But it's actually easy to explain. Basically, what happened is that our testing teams are critical because we have found time and again that for for what Zeek does, it is basically extremely hard to predict whether it is working correctly in any and all network environments. And we found multiple there where we had to go in and fix things more often than we thought, and then we were good to go. All right, but so in general, you know, this is our philosophy. And one more to add is that community input matters. This sort of relates to the first point, but if people show up with, you know, specific feature requests, specific things that should be prioritized are important to them and so forth, then we will try our best to accommodate that. Okay. Without further ado, here is the roadmap. So this is what we currently sort of have slated. I tried to group it along themes a little bit. Uh, so the first one is for Zeek 5.2 and infrastructure. And the first one is clearly, you know, Windows support. I was very tempted to make that its own theme like, wowza. <laughs> but uh, here we go. So it's clearly part of infrastructure. Um, so this is a, obviously a top priority for us. Like we said yesterday, the first PRs are already landing. And we're working closely with the Microsoft team to get the rest in as, as quickly as we can. So I'll just walk through these and say a couple of words for each of them. Uh, the, the management framework that I talked about yesterday is another biggie. So we basically have two more opportunities to get functionality in, in order to land this by 6.0. Um, this is mostly on my pile. I added names here when it's relatively clear that it, there's one or a set of people primarily in charge of the feature. Um, so the next things to talk about there are basically making zclient runnable independently and then closing the functionality gap to, to zcontrol. A couple uh, of people have recently been bitten by the fact that we don't seamlessly support multiple loggers right now. You will notice this if you try to run multiple on the same system and use file-based logging because the files can basically clobber each other. And this is actually really straightforward to fix. We just need to go in there and make sure that the do not clobber each other. Um, so it's it's been sitting there for a while, and we should just finally get to that. Um, the next one we're all quite excited about. This is ongoing work um, to disentangle analyzers and logs. This is currently sort of an Arnis pile. And what this means is basically that we would like to have more fine-grained control um, over what it means to run an analyzer and what it means to have the events created thrown by that analyzer are also triggering logs. And since events are sort of the, the machinery that underpins all of that, it would be really nice if, in as part of this work, we basically get more fine-grained control over um, which exact event handlers can run. So we're, we're tinkering with mechanisms there right now for perhaps tagging them at the individual level, at the file level, maybe in the future at the package level, and so forth, to be able to say, these just no longer need to run, or now they do need to run. And that then, in turn, would, for example, create a log. Another theme is um, accessibility and usability. Um, there has been a fair amount of work in that department lately. Uh, what Benjamin just sketched so nicely is part of that. So the first one on that list there that I really wanted to mention is out-of-the-box support for AF Packet. This seemed to resonate really nicely on Slack the other day. Uh, it's clearly the go-to packet capture technology on Linux these days. And it's so far been uh, basically maintained independently by, by Jan Grasshofer uh, in, a, in a separate Zeek package. And it just seems to make a lot of sense to pull that in um, and, and have it available on, on Linux systems out of the box. Um, we're pairing that with a push to also modernize the documentation about packet capture, basically in an effort to make it easier for people to get going. Uh, the current documentation there was quite dated and, you know, from, from year to year, uh, the, the, the dominant technologies in that space seem to shift a little bit, but AF Packet has clearly emerged sort of as a, as a foundation. Spicy. Spicy is the next thing on the list. Uh, spicy plus plus. <laughs> Just in the sense of there is not a new version of Spicy, but there is much more going on around Spicy these days. This is mainly in Robin and Benjamin's department. Um, an exciting thing that is about to happen um, that isn't technically tied to the 5.2 release, but can happen sort of before that, is ZKG package templating support for Spicy enabled Zeek packages. That was quite a mouthful, but you can basically run you know, a one-liner and you are uh, then able to basically get going on spicy analyzer development that can ship as a Zeek package, and you don't have to figure out, okay, so what exactly are the little bits that you have to put in the right files and so forth to start um, a particular analyzer, regarding, uh, regardless of if it's you know at the packet level, at the flow level, and, and, and so forth. And there's also ongoing work on reducing compilation times. I was reminded of the fact that I should not promise 
concrete speed up rates right now here, but it's looking quite good. I will stop there. <laughs> and uh, so that's, that's work in progress as well. The next point on my list relates strongly to what Smoot was talking about yesterday, because we would like to establish schema tooling. So we, we have you know this, this fact right now that when we roll out a new Zeek release that um, the best place you have for learning about potential changes to the log formats is in the news file or even the, the changes file if you want it a little more uh, low level. So you basically have to look for that closely. Um, and we think it would be quite nice if we could just sort of have one dedicated place where that is automatically sort of described and uh, flagged, particularly in terms of changes. So this might take us a little bit to get right, because as you might have noticed in, in, in Smooth's talk, there are bits that you can, with a little bit of elbow grease, sort of get easily right now, um, and other things that are just not quite there but should be accessible. So we might dig into, you know, ZikiGen and so forth a little bit to make that easier. And then there's a continuation of this dev tooling push, and this is really squarely what, what uh, uh, Benjamin just talked about. So he's been doing all his work on this language server, which is clearly coming along well, if you just saw him typing along. Um, there's been this sort of a little lull of activity in Zeek script, just because I've been a bit, little bit distracted lately with other stuff that would be really nice to return to, um, so that there are no longer any sort of questions about what a correctly formatted Zeek script looks like. Um, we have some editor modes in the working, including Emacs. Somebody on Slack just said, this is only for sending email. That is not the case. Um, and then uh, Tim clearly got triggered by uh, debugger scripts the other day, which was really awesome. So um, we have those at a minimum for LDB. Uh, um, GDB seems to be a little sort of more tricky to get up to the same level, but this is clearly really fun stuff, particularly once you need to start digging into bugs. Um, so for example, the ability is now there that when you get a, a backtrace at the, at the Zeek level, that when that backtrace involves um, functions that are actually about interpreting Zeek scripts, then you can see right in the in the backtrace in which lines in the scripts and in which scripts, you know, uh, the, the, the interpreter was when that backtrace got triggered, when that crash got triggered. So this is really cool. Uh, next theme for 5.2 is code quality. So uh, you heard from Tim about our fuzzing efforts, uh, particularly with OSS fuzz, which clearly has been really rewarding. Uh, it's been sort of a bit of a Pandora's box because it's clearly also taking us a lot of time. Um, but you know, oftentimes the findings are really pretty fun. Ask us about 16-bit fields that we didn't even know existed. Um, but uh, it's it's just cool. It's just it's it's been clearly. Uh, well worth the time so far, and we've had a lot of discussion internally about how to prioritize and deal with these. And we'll basically, we, we pretty much decided that for the time being, when these things come in, we'll prioritize them and and wait for the plateau. And then this 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 sort of theme is a little broader. Uh, we'd like to get our test coverage up to look a little better. Um, if you go to the wiki page, you see right now something that will be flagged in red and that I think is technically not actually quite accurate. The reality is better, but we can do even better than that. And it actually, I think, also covers test quality. I will flag the cluster test suite here that I mentioned yesterday in my talk because I think we can just sort of uh, up-level the testing a little bit to, to clusters at this point more broadly, and I think that will benefit us greatly. I think that's all I have for 5.2. So 5.2 should come out in the spring, early spring, right? Uh, which means that 6.0 is sort of late summer next year, if everything goes according to plan. And I don't mean for this stuff to be strictly about 6.0. This is literally the, the 6.x timeframe. So basically the next release cycle, as you saw in the beginning. So the first one on my list there is completion of the management framework. So at this point, you should hopefully be able to choose fully whether you want to use Z control or the management framework if you want to uh, run a cluster. We will not you know, kick out Z control at that point. It's just going to be deprecated fully realizing that a lot of you guys have been using it for a long time and are dependent on it. But that should be the point where you can really switch over and have equivalent, close to equivalent, maybe in parts better functionality. And I think this will be joined by cluster framework improvements. So another idea that's been out there for a long time in this space is uh, the notion of a, a cluster init event similar similar to um, Zeek init. And if you if you know a little bit about you know, how clusters are currently defined, then you know that this is actually quite rigid. There's basically a table that says for every node in the in the Z cluster, yeah, this is what it does, and so forth. And the, the, the this has downsides, particularly if you're thinking sort of about you know, dynamic elastic clusters and so forth, which arguably are not the most pressing need for Zeek. But um, as long as you can be in the sort of static domain, 
And then it's really nice because every node in the cluster has perfect understanding of whether it is fully connected to every other node that matter for it. And then basically, if you if you if you propagate that information, then the manager, for example, could say like, "Yep, everybody is fully checked in. We're good to go." And what would what that would enable is for additional scripts for packages and so forth to say, yeah, do this thing that I'm about, but only do it once the cluster is really up and going. Because if you don't have that, there's always this sort of slight awkwardness at the beginning that something might get lost just because not all nodes in the cluster were fully ready. So technically, that doesn't have to wait for 6.x. If somebody in the community would like to take that on, um, that could happen essentially anytime. This is not strictly dependent on the management framework, but I thought I'd, I'd add it in here. Next thing on the list, so we've had um, spicy around for a while now. You have it in the distribution out of the box now. So the, the hurdle to entry to writing spicy parsers is co really quite low at this point, further reduced with the introduce, introduction into the, uh, the package template. Um, but what is sort of the, 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 the final missing piece here is for us to actually migrate existing parsers in the distribution over to using spicy. So this is very much on the list. Um, the, the top two contenders there are Benjamin and Johanna. Um, and that should hopefully start landing in that time frame. Um, this is another one where I'll flag you know, the possibility for contributions from the community because the, 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 the list of analyzers is, is right there. You can see what's currently in the distribution. And it's just about uh, ideally coordinating with us, but, but basically picking one that you're interested in and then getting going. A slightly more sort of ambitious one that I flag here is, is the modernization and extension of the, the, the frameworks that are in place right now. And there are two contenders that are often mentioned. So one is a, a renewed or actually completely new alerting framework because the notion of what an alert really means in Zeek these days is a little um, dated or unclear, I would say. And uh, has several ideas have been kicked around there for what that could mean. Um, also thinking about the fact that more and more people are running Zeek and Suricata alongside, so that can that can you know lead to joint processing and so forth. So there's there's a bunch to con uh, contemplate there, and then in, in a related vein, uh, an authentication framework, which would be sort of um, meta level analysis based on what we already can tap in in various protocols, but abstracting that to the level of here is a user authenticating and being able or not able um, to log in. Um, again, that's, that, that idea has been around for a while. We haven't really, we just haven't really started focusing on it. And then there's really cool stuff like uh, additional features for the logging framework. And there's, there's a clear contender there that's also been out there for a while, uh, uh, high on the wish list, which is the idea of delaying log writes, where you would say that, OK, this, this log entry is here. Write it, but don't actually write it just yet. Keep it around for a little longer so that things can happen to that log entry until you really write it out. This is a little different from building up state um, that will eventually be uh, logged via a log write call. This is more about sort of late arrival of information that would enrich the data. This goes back to the question uh, for um, the talk earlier. All right, so that's the infrastructure theme for, for 6.x. Uh, I think accessibility and usability will be valid as a theme for quite a while longer. Um, a biggie there, I think, is uh, package tooling. So um, lately, not a lot really has changed in how um, ZKG does its job. We've improved things on the Zeek side, for example, by the ability to have these, these built-in plugins, right? So that you can say, like, here's technically a third-party plugin, but I want to build it into Zeek. That, too, has led to sort of some complications down the road because, for example, now you have this problem that if you actually um, as part of a dependency chain in Zeek packages, want to or need to install um, something that includes such a plugin, but you have that plugin compiled into Zeek, then those two things will clash. And so th there's some stuff there that we need to do to get these worlds to basically coexist better. And you know, several things come to mind that we can do there. And 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 even more general than that, in the in the first bullet point here is this this idea that. Um, it would be great if Zeek would actually know that a particular script is part of a package. So right now, Zeek actually knows nothing about Zeek packages. It just knows that there's a script, and it's part of the, the load tree and gets sourced in and runs. Um, but nothing says, you know, this is a package. The only entity that really knows that a, pa uh, a package exists or that a script is part of a package is ZKG via the mechanism it uses to deploy that stuff. Um, and another thing that isn't that great about ZKG right now is it's um, a 
ability to help you troubleshoot stuff. So I think this particularly applies to uh, packages containing plugins, where if anything goes wrong in the build, then you basically get this one liner that says like, yep, didn't work. Um, and then you have to know where to look and uh, sort of dig up the details in, 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 in logs that exist, at least usually. Um, but yeah, that basically like depend on you knowing your way around sort of the guts of the, the var folder in, in Zeek, and we can make that much better. Related things just came up the other day in discussion, things like um, the, the fact that ZKG sort of gobbles up state internally that we could sort of you know, kick out. But anyway, so, so all of this, I think, is, is, is helpful in making it easier to um, use these things, these things for people that are, that are not you know, as deeply into those uh, in details as, as we are on the development side. And then I, I have a final one that I that I titled New Worlds because there is some there is some exciting stuff happening uh, around basically just completely new infrastructures and ecosystems and and one of them some of you have I think seen before last year via ZeekJS via this idea that we could build a bridge to the JavaScript the Node.js world um, basically by recognizing that eventing isn't that you know uh, unique a concept to Zeek it, it's just very sort of dominant in Zeek but. In, uh, in the JavaScript environment that is certainly you know, uh, uh, easy to leverage. And what Arna has prototyped here in the past was basically a really impressive technical uh, uh, feat that sort of recognizes just how powerful the notion of an I.O. source uh, can be in, in Zeek and basically hook up entire, an, an entirely different interpreter to Zeek that way. Um, and if you think of the the number of things out there that are total no-brainers in the JavaScript world. And now you think that you could start interacting with those via Zeek, then that enables a whole bunch of stuff. So we are going to explore this further, and I think it would be nice if we made the, the barrier to entry there very low so that people can start going on this. And, um, and then we'll see where we are. Um, because if this is something that a lot of people find really, really exciting, then you know that's going to accordingly go up in priority. And another one I thought I'd put on that list is um, more robust persistent support. So um, the only real mechanism that we have right now, other than you know the various kinds of log writers, um, is broker data stores for persisting something out. And um, it is easy to conceive of certain of, of circumstances where you need you know high transaction rates or you know just things that broker data stores weren't really um, designed for. Um, and so we've started tinkering with this. It's really too early to say much about this other than uh, we're just sort of taking a look at what it might look like to directly interact with you know, SQL or other data stores, maybe Redis and so forth. Uh, we're, we're prototyping this just with a bunch of BIFs and seeing where we land. Um, the obvious things that will come up soon is sort of like this stuff is just too slow. It needs to run asynchronously, that kind of thing. But it's very much in that theme of like interacting with other things out there. Um, and the second one I wanted to put on there is that we're continuing to explore endpoint monitoring. Right now, the most um, uh, relevant approach there is uh, Robin's push uh, with the new iteration of Zeek Agent, where I think we continue to look for you know uh, uh, people to uh, try it out and share feedback. And the idea there is essentially something that's incredibly relevant to what the Microsoft folks are now doing. But once you have a host-based footprint where you run Zeek on a machine, you technically no longer need to focus on the network. You can also start looking at, at, at input that you get from the machine directly and then feed that into the event-based processing. For me, Zeek is usually you know, sort of three things. It's a, it's a cool programming language. Um, it's, it's all about network monitoring, but it is also a distributed event-based system. And if we manage to tap you know, the world of the host, then there is a whole new world there. That's it in terms of roadmap. I, I, we all ask you to get involved. We are really as approachable as we can be. Uh, Kelly has cookies, although I think at this point they're gone. You have to come back next time. <laughs> I, uh, I, I have a whole bunch of points here for how you can interact with us. I'm not going to walk you through this, but I'm going to call out three things in particular. So the first one is please, please, please tell us your use cases. Tell, tell us things you'd like to see in Zeek that it currently doesn't do well, that it doesn't do at all, and so forth. And the reason why I'm really calling this out is because if you look at the composition of the core Zeek development team, then you will notice that we do not day-to-day -day run a cluster. We, do, we, we are not security analysts. Part of the, the, the wonderful uh, presence of Seth Hall in the past of the project was that he had that connection to 
you know, in, in his case, Ohio State, but basically he was day to day involved in like, yeah, this is this is what I need. This is what would be great for Zeke and so forth. So we are actually really dependent on you guys to get us that kind of feedback. So if you have anything, then please get in touch. Um, the second one, a little further down there, is we've lately been fortunate in that uh, people have shown up who are clearly extremely technically skilled and can basically work on pretty much any level of contribution. And this is a, a point where it's a good um, you know, moment to remind people that if you are engaging in bigger contributions, then please get in touch early so that we can make sure that this is exactly what we need. Um, this is, there's no reason to be concerned or anything, it's just like that. This is really good stuff that's coming in here, and and if if these things get even bigger, then let's coordinate because I think it'll help. Um, and then the third one down there that's highlighted is testing environments. So we have a testing subgroup. These are the folks who basically are first to try out our release candidates right now. That would be RC one four five dot one um, in their testing clusters, in their production clusters, even whatever have you, um, because we really rely on this. We have, like I said earlier, found time and again that no matter the amount of testing we do, you deploy it in a completely new network and there is something that we hadn't considered because there is a bottleneck somewhere in the code that we just hadn't triggered in any other way. So if you're at all interested in this and you don't need to be running a 200 node cluster, it can really be anything that is up for you know days at a time and sees you know decent use, um, we would be grateful. And I think that's all I had. I just collected a couple of links here for particularly the newcomers. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions you might have. Questions? No. <gasps> of Hi, course. Smoot <laughs> has a question coming. Well, it's sort of a Robin transition question. <laughs> Where, where's the spicy roadmap? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Smoot. <laughs> Do you want to say anything, Robin? Or um, sorry, I, I can barely see you back there. Yeah, wait, wait, okay. The second part of what was what was the question? The spicy roadmap. Okay. Um, wait. So so the immediate roadmap was on there, and there was perf so perf performance is actually I think the main bottleneck right now. So so we we, we do make want to make a push to improve performance. <clears throat> Um, beyond that, it's an, there, there's some open questions how to continue. So that's another area actually for feedback. So, so people have uh, started to, I think, get quite comfortable writing spicy analyzers at this point. Um, I would be interested to hear what, what, what's missing at this point. Or what, what, what should we be taking next as the next step? Um, one feature I would still like to bring back, which the original prototype had, is, is trace rewriting where we um, use the, the, the spicy uh, grammars to actually produce traffic. And then you can start anonymizing traffic, for example. So I think that is a, is a nice feature that, that is right now, right now not in there, but that, which we had originally in the, in the prototype. So that would be one venue to, to proceed. Yeah. Maybe, maybe one point that comes to mind, and I don't actually know if you think that way about this, Robin. It'd be good to know. As I noticed yesterday, somebody said, like, spicy is for network protocols. And, and I don't think that's true in that absolute a sense. It was a priority, but it's certainly suitable for many other data formats, right? So maybe if people have creative ideas there, that might be interesting. To yes, definitely. So, so there are a couple of things there. I mean, one is Spicy does already support other stuff than network protocols. So you can write a file analyzer for Zeek in Spicy right away. Uh, we don't have many of those yet, but there's, it's an open space for, for adding uh, support for, for various file formats to Zeek. Um, the second piece to that is, I think, use cases for spicy outside of Zeek. I mean, that's right. something where I'm particularly interested in. Um, we have heard some interest actually from the Wireshark community on, 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 on seeing if there's something where we can uh, collaborate and, and getting spicy in there. And, and Benjamin actually, um, a while ago already, wrote a prototype of, of a Wireshark integration. Yep. So that is something um, to explore. And, and any other project that is parsing stuff is in principle at a target for spicy. That's right. Yep. Cool. Any other questions? Is there anything here that you expected to hear about but didn't, for example? Be good good feedback. Oh, there's something over there.
Thanks. On the roadmap, I, I believe it was six points something. There was the uh, migration from the parsers from Seek to Spicy. Mm -hmm. um, is there are there also any plans to extend the current parsers? Uh, many parsers are quite old, and right. some functionality or some fields are missing. Right, right. Uh, we're not planning to extend the current ones unless you know the contribution just comes in. Let's say that way. But um, it'd be much better to just do that as part of the migration over to to, to Spicy. There's a uh, in, in 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 your point. There is an interesting sort of technical sub problem, sort of, which is like, what do you do with all the corners in the parsing effort where you where you know you're not exhaustively dealing with what you could parse? You know, like there's an enum and you you handle the first five, but you know later there is something added there. And, and, and what should we do to make sure that we, we are, first of all, aware of that and then prioritize? Um, so that's all really interesting. Um, but so if you have something in mind right now and, and you would like to have that yesterday, then we could probably still put that in there. But otherwise, we should get going on the transition first. Especially, and I should add, this is, I think, especially true when it involves bin pack, which you know, is the, 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 the parser technology that predates Spicy. And it's just really old at this point. And, and you know, sometimes we go in there still to look at something that might be a problem and so forth, but we're really reluctant to really put work in there at this point. So, yeah. That's it. Okay. All right. All right. Cool, guys. All right. Thank you, Thank Christian. you very much.